Welcome back to the Dark Paradigm Games podcast. I'm here with Jacqueline Martin, and I am Edwin Dyser. This is a continuation of an earlier podcast, which was about crowdfunding. In fact, it's part three of the series. So if you want a full picture of basically everything we know about crowdfunding, I recommend listening to the earlier podcasts. Otherwise, stay tuned. And today we'll be talking more specifically about how to write and craft a good crowdfunding campaign once you've decided on your platform. So that includes things like the video, thumbnail image, what text to include, what not to include, the reward tiers, and so on. We've talked quite a lot in the previous podcast about some of these sort of broader things to plan out, but specifically try to get a number of people who you know will back the game lined up before it releases. Uh, there's nothing more depressing than a 0% funded game with like a $5,000 target and it's got zero pledges. Um, I was talking about social proof earlier. Um, you want some people who immediately pledge for the game on its release when it's got that initial interest then then you've got some social proof yeah. that it's an interesting project people who haven't heard of your project now will take a look at it hopefully you know if they see oh it's 20 percent funded in those initial couple of days they're much more likely to check it out um Definitely. so yeah line up friends family um people who are active in your social media communities Tell them about it in advance. Show them trial pages. Kickstarter lets you show people preview pages that haven't gone live yet. Show them that. Ask mm. them what they think. What's their opinion? How can I improve it? This is really valuable to ask for your game's community. That's indeed really valuable. Um, because it also lets you know what sort of rewards are they interested in? Uh, what sort of amounts are they interested in pledging? And not only that, it gets them emotionally invested in your crowdfunding project, which is brilliant. Because if they're emotionally yeah. invested, they're more likely to give you a pledge. And they're more likely that's, to be happy about doing it. It's a win-win. That's a good point. Just, just get more people really involved and interested, I would say. And also, I think it's it's a really good point you brought because it's that similar thing uh where if you feel like you contributed to something, you are less likely to go against it in a way. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So now that we've talked so much about pre-launch strategies, you also want to have a strategy for during, for, well, the mid part of your campaign, how to keep that momentum going when, when you're in that phase where you won't have that many pledges because as we already said you will have the most pledges in the beginning and at the end but you do want to have that momentum and just keep going and how do you maintain that a few options would be to stream during your campaign there, there's also or was a kickstarter live tool i don't know if it's still there but apparently you can stream over kickstarter too and um, what you definitely also don't want to do is to hold content back. You want to push out as much content in the beginning as possible. And what I've noticed from successful campaigns is that they all have a lot of GIFs, a lot of pictures, just a lot of proof that this game is going to be made and that this game is worth trusting and investing into. And the more you can show through pictures, um, the more... You can also drag people into the world you're trying to create with your game and just get them invested. I think um, a lot of hmm. these successful projects have quite continuous updates throughout the Kickstarter campaign on the Kickstarter uh, page. Now, yeah. people seem to assume that's helpful. I think it is. But um, I think it's very important, to be honest, from what I've noticed through the failed Kickstarter campaign that I've seen, because what I've seen is that people almost expect updates because they want to know, okay, how's the how's the um, game itself progressing? What are the news? Where's where are you at right now? And the more updates you can also bring, the the more likely you will have people, yeah 
being excited about it. Now, this is something I haven't looked into. But my suspicion mm. is these regular updates might make you feature better in the Kickstarter algorithm. Oh, that's a yeah. good point, actually. So most of these, I mean, pretty much most things with a search box have some kind of algorithm that decides what comes up first when you search. Um, I reckon a very active page will be one of them. So I think that might be why these regular updates are important. Because to be honest, if you've already been backed by a backer... Um, with the greatest of respect to that backer, you're actually you're more interested now in getting other backers, um, yes, th rather than just keeping the current backers very pleased with what they've backed. Um, hmm. Obviously, that's important. I wouldn't important, even say but... so. No? Yeah, so sorry, I wouldn't even say so because I think the backers you already brought on, they are also probably likely to tell to their friends hey there's this awesome project i'm backing right now and there's only this and this amount left uh, maybe you can like look at it or something that's like a possibility oh, yeah of course i don't you really have to <laughs> uh strike a chord with that specific person but sometimes that does happen i suppose yeah which brings us to that tone of the updates they always look really excited if they read like um I've blanked for the term, you know, they're just monthly patch notes. That's it. If they read like patch mm. notes, um, they don't convey any excitement around the project. So these updates are trying to generate buzz. And I think that is the value among people already back backing your project. If they feel like what they've backed is continually developing, really exciting, there's a lot of buzz, they might tell their friends. Um, however, I think it's actually really useful, especially useful for the end of your campaign where people who haven't heard of your product yet um, see mm. your product again because it's it's higher up on the uh, Kickstarter algorithm. You get a boost at the start and end. Um, so you're going to get some new people coming in. If they see that these updates have been regular throughout the campaign, they'll see, oh, it's been an active campaign. It's been popular. It implies there's been interest in it. Maybe nobody was asking you for these updates, but they don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe everybody told you, please stop sending us updates. But it makes your game actually look like there's a lot of interest. So people are demanding these updates, which is great. Yeah. Uh, and it also makes it look like your backers are valued, which is, of course they are. Well, I hope they are. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's proof of that. It's showing, yes, I value my backers and I want to keep them in the loop up to date on what yeah. I'm making. I want to keep things transparent and I want them to be as involved as possible in the process of uh, making this game. Yeah, also it gives a better idea of how the project will look after its execution. How will it look like when it's financed? You want to give as much of uh, as a preview and what can be expected as possible so people can be hyped about it again. And... Um, What I also find important when we are at the momentum and how to um, just keep growing is to look maybe into collaborations or people that would like to uh, cooperate somehow together with your team and maybe have something like a specific character from, from another indie game appear in your game or something like that. That is something I would maybe find interesting um, if I like for example, a specific game and suddenly see a character I like in the crowdfunding campaign of another game. Um, but I think for that, you really need to have friends or people that would be interested inside of the indie game community to also do that for you. Yeah. I would also suggest um, prepare this kind of stuff beforehand. So just like you prepared that your game will have some immediate backers among friends and family and community, um, prepare the publicity you're going to have for this Kickstarter campaign uh, beforehand. Have a sort of calendar of uh, social media posts, articles, journalists, interviews and collaborations, of course. Um, have that planned out in advance. Um, my impression and this is just a suspicion, I'm just speculating, is that most of your beginning and ending publicity will come from within the platform of Kickstarter. I think the middle probably comes from elsewhere because you're buried quite low within search results mm -hmm. when your campaign's mm -hmm. got like 15 days to go or whatever, roughly halfway through. Yeah. Um, so I would really 
ramp up the publicity that is trying to bring in new people during the middle of the campaign period. At the start, I do very targeted campaigning that is targeted at people who already are interested and support your game because you're just looking for that initial burst of backers that gives you social proof. Um, from the end, I I don't really have any strong ideas for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just had this crazy idea a second ago where I just thought, okay, probably a lot of journalists or, um, yeah, well, gaming journalists that are looking for finding that new uh, indie game that's going to be a massive hit are uh, going through Kickstarter and looking for these games. And I thought, like, okay, how can you just, like, catch the attention of these? And then I was thinking, hmm, what's actually the highest... Um, amount of money that was ever asked for a game and maybe just try to break that record <laughs> even though you don't want to uh, earn all that much money but just to to you know like get that attention yeah minimum pledge ten thousand dollars target pledge ten thousand dollars <laughs> so just game get only one for rich on people and, and then you, you own like that the game itself and the asset store again yeah. and also like and you become just the only owner of the game <laughs> that would be there's probably interest in that if if anybody's listening hilarious. i guess you could use that idea <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> yeah you're welcome let us know if it works <laughs> yeah um yeah so i talked a little about your your target um audience i think that's quite important and how you can target them at the beginning of your kickstarter um, but that also leads us to the tone, the general tone and uh, character of your Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my experience has been so far that it's, you want to keep it light or at least fresh and maybe even a little quirky and funny. What would you say? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think uh, it has to be entertaining to read, unfortunately. Um, it can, <laughs> Why unfortunately? It takes more time. It's more difficult. Um, it doesn't have uh. to read like patch notes again. We, we don't want that. If uh, you can't communicate enthusiasm for your game, then why should other people be enthusiastic? So you can communicate enthusiasm through a more informal tone, you know, use exclamation marks, ask rhetorical questions, uh, get not too silly, but, you know, a bit silly can be quite fun to read actually humor obviously is great um you just want to get people as involved as possible and make it feel i think with crowdfunding you really want to hit an emotional chord you want to to pitch your product on an emotional level more than just like a really practical nuts and bolts level so you're just trying to get people yeah. to feel excitement and enthusiasm and fun humor uh interest uh i yeah. think that's where we come back and it's like a full circle to sell the personality of yourself yeah. and your project and i think in a, in a very cliche way it's what it kind of boils down to and as we already mentioned in the beginning there is no hundred percent strategy of how to go about it but this is basically what we found and gathered yeah 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 um and that also leads to the accountability and so on so uh it's a balance between this very casual uh tone uh one well, doesn't have to be very casual but casual tone and also looking extremely sincere and trustworthy and being transparent with your page um so this uh text has to communicate very clearly why uh, a, a few things it has to say why your team is the best team to do the job <laughs> and well for dark paradigm games that's easy of course because <laughs> okay, we're the best sorry, team to do the job <laughs> join our crowdfunding campaign we haven't announced it yet but probably in about two months <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> um, but yeah that's really important because you need to uh make it clear that whatever you're making you're the only people who can make it now, I, it doesn't yeah. even matter if you agree with that or not. Uh, chances are, if it's a game, yes, 
nobody, no other team would make a game exactly like yours. Uh, and if they would, I'm afraid you, you're probably quite unlikely to get crowdfunding because, as I was saying earlier, uh, more unique products that are more personal and sort of look a bit less corporate and money grabbing uh, tend to do better on crowdfunding. Just that's the nature of the platform. So if you make your team look very unique, very skilled and very passionate about this game and then go further and say why only you can do that because everything I've just said, like passion, skill, talent, mm -hmm. that I'm sure they'll come up in every Kickstarter. They're very generic words. You need to take that yeah. step further to say, actually, we can. We are the only people who can do this, and we can only actually, do this with a bit of your money. Crazy. <laughs> 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 But um, I think it's also important to not to be sh too shy to ask for help, and uh, to really, well, not straight out begging maybe but to really say hey we really need your help we want to make this happen and this is why and your help is important to us and this would mean so much to us if you would help us oh yeah you know to yeah well even the well-funded games ask that there there's often that a personal moment of one of the game's creators looking into the camera and saying we need your help to make this we need your money to do this i was looking at the abduction kickstarter earlier um and i'm i misremember most things i say but i think that had a target pledge of about 1.4 million euros uh you know abduction is quite a big mm -hmm. game um and that's a that's a big target pledge nonetheless there was this humble moment in the video um of one of the creators saying actually we need to take this kickstarter route because of this we need your help because of this, um, even if it's uh, quite a high budget project, uh, at least from our perspective. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I wouldn't even say it's that humble, to be honest, it's sort of necessary. People people do want to know why yeah. you need why their Kickstarter, help. Why Kickstarter, why crowdfunding. Exactly. exactly. That's, that's yeah. an important point to cover. Yeah, what, what I personally also find important is that you may be backed with the account that you're creating the crowdfunding on another project just to also feel or get a feeling for how it is to be a backer. Maybe you notice it's really not your thing and that you really didn't like backing projects and that you thought it was a really bad experience. And then you also maybe just notice oh okay crowdfunding is actually not the thing i want to do because it was such a bad experience for me yeah and it also just looks better i want to say if you also backed other people's projects because then it's again not only asking but also involving yourself a little more into that whole community yeah i would say um even just as an exercise and I actually do do this with real money just like Take a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, and just find a game on Kickstarter that you want to back. Um, <laughs> do it now. Yeah, do it now. <laughs> oh, in no, two no, months. Actually, wait, I have a feeling this is a really good project. Legion's coming Masters <laughs> crowdfunding campaign is live. And oh then, my God. <laughs> you know, make up your own mind. Make up your own mind. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely not begging for help here. <laughs> But, you know, if you've got 20, 20 40, oh. 50,000 dollars, just <laughs> like, small yeah. amount. I mean, <laughs> exclusive access for 20,000 dollars. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> we also take Hong Kong dollars. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. How much was the uh, JTSC? Thirty thousand Hong Kong dollars should do it. In in the text, uh, I've been talking about the tone and a bit of humor and so on. Uh, but regarding selling your team um, and Kickstarter itself, What? Uh, not selling my team. Well, like selling your team as a, a group that can make products, like uh, marketing yourself, basically. Um, <laughs> oh, just my bad humor striking. Oh, oh. No, no, the the. I promise, I won't sell you into slavery. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kickstarter alternatives. <laughs> I'm just waiting for a higher bidder. But um, 
<laughs> you uh, you need to sell your. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll avoid that phrase. You need to market <laughs> your team. Um, so tell your story, and this is an easy thing to do. Basically, in any good story, you need to explain uh, what your background is, how you ended up where you are, both as individuals within your team. We decided we're going to include bios, uh, biographies, short ones, in our crowdfunding page. Most successful yeah. crowdfunders include biographies for each team member, and they read quite well. Um, so show that, show how the team came together, show how you got to where you are today, explain mm -hmm. with like as, as a story don't just give like one word answers explain why you're making this particular game and what you believe in as a team um and then go into your plans what you hope to achieve um you've already explained hopefully why you're on crowdfunding and why you need the money but what you plan to do with this money give as much detail as possible be really clear also celebrate what you've already achieved any good story and this is extremely obvious has a beginning middle and an end the beginning introduces the characters and the people involved in the story in the middle there's some kind of challenge typically and in the end that gets resolved and a good story or very good stories often don't fully resolve and that's why you're talking about your future plans because you don't want to make it seem mm. <laughs> like the crowdfunding page is the end of your journey. It's not. You, it generates yeah. excitement if you're explaining there's much more after this to come as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I could not agree more with what you said, but I definitely want to add to that, that you, when you go to Kickstarter, you do need to do your target market research. And what I found very helpful is, <clears throat> to nail down your target audience and you could do that theoretically through a sentence like our target market is brackets gender aged and then you have the age range and who live in a place or type of place and like a certain activity and through that you also know what type of <clears throat> audience you try to reach and can write your message more clearly to them And uh, that also helps in telling your story. Um, Fast-paced battle royale game with um, cartoon-like graphics. Well, that's probably going to appeal to a, a younger, maybe teenage audience. Um, also, bear in mind your pledge amounts should roughly align to that target audience. Yeah. Uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, one interesting thing I also still want to add, which is kind of unrelated right now, is that I've seen for other um, campaigns that there exists something that's called backercamp.com, which is, um, I don't know if it's a company, but they seem to specialize in trying to make campaigns successful. Yeah. And uh, you can apply to them if you already have a running campaign, which I found very interesting. And um, yeah, I've not tried it. I cannot uh, vouch for them or tell you how good they are, but it exists. And um, yeah, so maybe let's go through uh, or over the rewards. Um, we both wrote some ideas down and I think there are a lot of good ideas um, we've gathered. Just going to interrupt that yeah. because it relates to what you just said. Uh, Kickstarter actually has oh, yeah. some very good resources on their own website. They've made a list of uh, crowdfunding experts and marketers on their own website. Oh. They want your campaign to okay. succeed because then they get to take their cut. So, yeah, of course they want to help. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so the, the URL is uh, www.kickstarter.com uh, forward slash experts. That URL will take ah. you to a list of people who can help you with your crowdfunding campaign if it's wow. a higher budget. Um, I, I mean, That's if your target pledge is $1,000, then yeah. you, you'd probably be spending that entire amount on one of these hmm. experts. Not that we've approached one. I wonder, yeah, I, I wonder how that works if they're like, okay, uh, if it succeeds, then we take a certain amount of uh, the total uh, that you made because that would make a lot of sense for me. But then again, um, 
that that would mean that they're working for free until that point, which yeah. then again doesn't make that much sense. <laughs> yeah, it's probably both. Um, I really vaguely remember a conversation with a friend who worked in marketing who was talking about how they, they get paid like a fairly low hourly wage and then a um, percentage of... Uh, or a bonus according to the amount of conversions they get or the amount of products they sell. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'd expect okay. it to be something like that. Um, yeah, anyway, back to the, the rewards yeah. tiers. <laughs> back to the rewards. Go, <laughs> yeah, we, both, <laughs> we both wrote down um, some. And since I'm more of the uh, art person, creative director, my first idea was, oh, let's make an art book. And then I researched and found out how much... Uh, some things like art books cost and whew. <laughs> I've never made an art book before but um, I made small booklets before and they were not that expensive but art books they are expensive is it the high quality printing if yeah, yeah. if you want to go high quality it's it's not so cheap but um, you can get if, if you um, make your rewards in, in a fashion that you say, okay, you can get a digital art book and then you can also get a hardcover printed out art book that's, well, just lying uh, in front of you, in front of you and, you know, that that's just tangible. Then um, you, you can have these rewards that go with this digital version and the non-digital version that, that you really say, okay, at 250 uh, um, then it makes even only sense to start printing um, these art books uh, then you can only offer the digital and then maybe later the non-digital versions yeah um, same goes for soundtrack for example uh, that you could also only offer in digital and then later in non-digital yeah, I've seen some soundtracks being offered as a reward tier on an LP. Um, mm. yeah, yeah, because I've seen that too. Honestly, I'm I'm not convinced. <laughs> but if your game soundtrack is the kind of soundtrack that people would have on LPs, LPs are, are still a fairly niche thing, then uh, yeah, go for it. I think CDs are yeah. s- sort of dying a bit in popularity. Like, uh, I, I met agree. some people the other day who didn't know what CDs were. I can't believe it. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. It's ridiculous. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's, I, I doubt they know what LPs are as well, but they're, they're enjoying a research. Maybe if you made like a custom a custom made um, USB stick with the music on, I think that would be also yeah. really cool. Yeah, that's cool. The um, other th- because it's yeah. still digital, but also not. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> depending on your game soundtrack, and this is just impossible for some game soundtracks, you can also offer sheet music. So that's going to work very well for visual novels, for example, that often mm-hmm. just have acoustic instruments. There's plenty of visual novels that almost only use a piano in their soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And by offering that sheet music with the original soundtrack, um obviously any of your backers who do play piano or whatever instrument can um have a go at the soundtrack so, out of interest would that be possible for our project unfortunately no um it mostly because most <laughs> of our it. soundtrack is made using distorted instruments or just not mm. acoustic instruments so a lot of it is purely electronic or for example, I think uh, I'll probably be talking about the soundtrack on a separate podcast at some point. But yeah, um, yeah. the for example, <laughs> foreshadowing. Yes, the the soundtrack for <laughs> Camp Death Swamp is an electric cello, which would be playable fine. But there's so much reverb added onto it, so much echo effect, and so much mangling that I've done to the sound that even if I wrote down the notes that you would be playing, it wouldn't mm. sound like it. it. It would sound really boring. Yeah, that actually brings me to the idea of maybe having like a, um, what's it called? You know, colorization book where you draw in the colors of certain That would be things. so cool. Yeah, that as a reward. Um, maybe additional to an art book or whatnot. But yeah, I think that could be really cool. That would be cool. awesome. Do you have the original black and whites before you've colored in your art? 
Oh yeah, yeah, I have the line work on everything. So that's, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of already done, and the printing cost should be way lower because it's black and oh, white. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Huh. <laughs> also, with the uh, complete UI elements we just uh, remade, there's so much line work I made there, and it's uh, you, you can like adjust them so easily. So that's actually a pretty good point. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, let's uh, <laughs> let's do that. Um, Let's do that. Yeah. But okay. there's, there's um, usually a warning uh, with any crowdfunding recommendations page to be careful with the physical items. Um, it's oh, it's a definitely. very good idea, first of all, to specify where you're shipping. Now, I think some crowdfunding platforms, and I can't remember if Kickstarter allowed this, uh, let you add money onto certain reward tiers. Let's say for mm -hmm. $20, if you live in the U.S., you can get a t-shirt. Um, I think some platforms let you specify, but if you're outside of the US, this this reward is not available to you. You don't get the t-shirt. Or if you're outside of the US, you need to pay an extra $10 uh, to cover our shipping expenses. Mm -hmm. um, and do not underestimate shipping expenses. It, it probably is yes. going to be something like $10 to send your shirt abroad. Um yeah yeah maybe even more like some sometimes shipping can go up to like 20 or 30 euros yeah. um I think. kickstarter also uh has a page for um third parties who can outsource physical rewards for you so they've got a list oh, of like printers okay. and t-shirt makers and people who can help you with logistics so shipping stuff mm -hmm. and all of that stuff if you want to go crazy with physical rewards which i don't recommend unless you really know what you're doing and you've really carefully added yeah. up the sums but if you do and you realize like you're a five-person team uh, when the campaign ends you can't possibly spend like a month just putting posters yeah. into tubes and posting them to people. Um, <laughs> you can outsource it and Kickstarter has that resource at, and sorry, this is not catchy at all, but the address is kickstarter.com uh, slash help slash resources question mark ref <laughs> equals handbook fulfillment. Uh, we'll put a link in the description, I think. Just use Google. <laughs> this is my recommendation here. Yeah. Or just use Google. <laughs> um... Yeah, um, luckily, uh, we, we already have some physical um, rewards, like mm -hmm. the team pins we have. Yeah. And we still have five left, which is also something that makes them very rare because they're hand-painted and unique and only the first few members of our development team have them. And that as a reward is really cool, I think. Yeah, it's also small, so it's easy yeah. to post. <laughs> Uh, we could post that to America that, and, I don't know, it would cost like $5 or something. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, pins in general. Um, yeah, if, if we just go down uh, the list of what else you could uh, put as a reward, I think the easiest that pops up is just credit entry inside of your game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, maybe you want to add some more. Um, yes, so... Crediting a person in the game doesn't have to just be in a credits list at the end of the game. Um, depending on the rewards tier, you might want to, uh, for example, put the backer's name on a, an NPC or a villain or a place <laughs> name. Um, obviously, you need to specify on the campaign that it has to be subject to approval. So if the person has an offensive mm -hmm. name, uh, that doesn't make it into your game, unless you're making that kind yeah. of game, in which case, go for it. Uh, maybe an inoffensive <laughs> game would, wouldn't be approved. Um, so, yeah, you could also have mentions in game. Like, you could just mention that person in the game lore. Uh, for example, just have a couple of characters oh, yeah. talking about Edwin the barkeep. Um, yeah, who, yeah, who, maybe you never uh, see them exciting. in the game but it's quite an easy way to just uh, acknowledge somebody. And it's really cool as well. Uh, I think that's yeah. a nice I mean, if, if, yeah. if you're also like trying to design more content for your game anyhow, then you could also offer that as a reward. Yeah. Designing quest lines, dungeons, or in our case, for example, hunting grounds or creatures. Or to even have people as a portrait, in our case, as 
survivors it's called in in your game so you make a digital um, version of them yeah and then you then they are like digitally in the game which i think would re would be really cool because our entire team is already kind of in the game as portraits and um <laughs> it's really fun i think jackie's very good at and them. <laughs> i'm just having way too much fun with it <laughs> <laughs> to be honest <laughs> no such thing as way too much fun yeah, but that's how kind of Jeremy ended up as a huge barbarian without <laughs> yeah. uh, any clothes on. <laughs> I quite like uh, Juan's as well. Like a dark <laughs> Pikachu. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I try to go as close as... Because he's kind of the mascot of the team and uh, kind of a Pikachu theme around him. And I try to go as close to Pikachu without getting sued. Yeah. <laughs> And it kind of turned out like an, I don't know, a demon kind of horn yellow thing. I don't know, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's very <laughs> cool. Um, um, yeah, the yeah. Um, the game that I was talking about earlier, JTSC, has some really high hmm. reward tiers, but they are, people are biting. People are going for those reward tiers. Um, because it seems people quite like having their ideas crop up in a game. So this mm -hmm. game, for example, lets you create new furniture in the game oh. or come up with the idea for a costume for a character. So you could like hmm. draw a doodle and then they'll make it happen. Um, nice. I think it lets you come up with even at the highest rewards um, a design for an in-game character. Just a completely wow. complete design for an in-game character. Now, obviously, you need to be able to follow through on this stuff. So if your game is already full of characters and you just don't want any more, don't offer reward tiers that let people come up with new, yet even more character ideas. But if there's yeah. space, and there probably is, then uh, these are really cool rewards and they are actually worth a decent amount. We're talking about like uh, yeah. $200 reward tiers here and and more mm -hmm. for this jtsc game that that people are paying yeah. for people like it um so yeah. don't don't undervalue that and remember it's actually going to be quite a lot of work as well to you know digitize yeah. somebody's that, that would be my next point i think designing content in collaboration with the creators is really something people like but it also puts a lot of strain on you on how to manage it what and how do you want to have this designing content process um, managed for for yourself, for your team? Because you also need to think about how you want to approach it. Um, do we want to give our templates as to, okay, here, this would be a character template, draw some clothes on it, and um, we would uh, try to go as close as possible later on in the game with it. Because... Um, you don't want to waste too much energy into this if, if it's taking uh, or making your backers unhappy in the end then maybe rather not have it as a reward yeah and the other important point is uh, you may not like what this backer comes up with it may be exactly. like your game has a green color theme and they've come up with a pink dress uh, and it just doesn't fit that well um, I, I'm not really sure how to get around that, but just always put in this disclaimer, you know, it's subject to our approval and uh, subject yeah. to a bit of discussion. Um, we've offered um, being able to name in-game areas uh, before as mm -hmm. a reward on our Discord. Who won that Prism Wind? Oh, of course, wanted. Prism Wind, yeah. And I totally thought he would take his own name because I think it's an awesome name, but then he went for something completely it's different Scabrous which streams. is also fine yeah, yeah but we should do that more often i think yeah. that was cool we were quite pleased with the result mm. though so he discussed that mostly with jackie and yeah. i think the name Scabrous streams is actually a very nice fit uh yeah. for that area yeah I, I liked it a lot too so i mean don't just assume um, people mm -hmm. will come up with awful names either but it, you know it's it's, <laughs> it's a risk um <laughs> Yeah. So um, other rewards could be special supporter content, um, a pre-launch access to a certain Kickstarter version, for example. Yeah. Or maybe in our case, in-game currency 
other more artistic ideas I had were uh, wallpaper, postcard or um, signed prints. And then like very, very, very expensive for meet and greet. But <laughs> yeah. you can say basically if they are living near you. So I'd be quite happy to meet somebody in London, for example. You can meet and greet, take a photo, have a lunch in person. I'd say probably put a time limit on it. Um, you don't want it to feel hurried. You probably don't want one it handshake, to be, yeah, one Bye. half a handshake <laughs> with opportunity to continue. Only pinky for fingers a, for a five pound supplement. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So there, there was that. There was the um, you can option, uh, give an option of like having a phone call or an interview uh, with one of the game developers of the backers' choice, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, Jackie pointed out just be careful of language barriers. So do specify what language that would be in. Um, yeah. You can offer follow backs on social media. That's a very cheap thing to do. That's probably a fairly low reward. But, you know, somebody backs wow. you, they send you what their social media is. Maybe give them a shout out or just follow them back on social media. I've seen that being offered. Okay. Um, you can offer them access to your premium Discord channel. Uh, we have one that is a reward for um patreon Our subscribers patreon. but that is yeah. also a potential reward on a crowdfunding platform um you can also offer tutorials or lessons i'd say uh again that if if it's a lesson just put like an hour time limit on it or whatever uh let the backer specify what they want to be taught um and yeah you can do that via a screen sharing app or whatever um, or yeah. if it doesn't have to be live, um, you can make a tutorial on that subject. Yeah, that's not exciting. Um, in our case, we could even uh, make something like a, um, a small podcast shout out or if the person has a good microphone and is fluent in English and maybe it's the highest backer or something, it would be really interesting to have that person as a guest on the podcast. Like, hey, what made you... Uh, spend this amount of money on this game that would be really interesting from from yeah just a creator perspective i feel yeah of course and it helps generate publicity around the game as well but um it's a really nice way of acknowledging high backers um oh and the other thing is and this is less direct but instead of a phone call you could offer a backer a chance to ask you uh three questions which you uh, then answer the nice thing about a lot of these things is you actually now end up with social media posts and you know you can publish these answers publicly you can send your tutorial uh public you can put it on youtube or whatever so um that's a nice bonus uh hmm. yeah I, i think you've mentioned early access which is really a, a really nice one uh, we haven't yet yeah. mentioned probably the most compelling reward you can offer for a game which is a free copy of that game um yes um if your game is not free <laughs> if it's free then i would always say um in-game currency yeah. now the really important thing about offering in-game currency as a reward is let the person know what that will buy them in the game because if yeah, they've never played true. the game before what does it mean to them that we've offered them a hundred dark dimes that's a completely redundant gesture because nobody has a clue how much that buys you so and uh, yet another thing that this jtsc uh page does pretty nicely is um it's offering gems as an in-game currency reward and it's telling you mm -hmm. what those gems can buy you in the game um and i think the more specific you can be about what that in-game currency buys you the better Because now you're actually giving something that has a tangible value as opposed to just this uh, nebulous, like very ill-defined, just, oh, and we'll give you 10 of this stuff. It's like, what does that <laughs> even mean? Um, yeah. Oh, and another thing about giving your rewards value is you may, uh, well, you definitely want to include photos of, or at least designs of uh, <laughs> just love yet something Jackie is highlighting. You definitely want to include <laughs> photos of your physical gifts um, and dimensions. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, they may not be made yet, but at least a prototype. That I think that's really important. You may also want to include a picture 
or um, a model or a uh, drawing of non-physical rewards. For example, a free copy of the game. Your game might be purely digital, but draw a copy of a game box. Um, yeah, that that you can do a lot through mock-ups. Yeah. Um, if you're not so inexperienced, uh, in, if you're uh, inexperienced in uh, that regard, there are a lot of free mock-ups. If you Google, um, just type in uh, phone, iPhone, or whatever, and then mock-up, and then you have a lot of different things coming up, and that's how you can give really quickly immediate value to your page it, it just makes you look so much more professional yeah. if a non-physical thing comes with a picture it just makes it look like a thing it, it makes yeah. it look like <laughs> it has more value as an object so um, and it does never underestimate the value of digital assets i mean you've put a lot of time into making them they uh they are valuable things um but we're just hardwired to think if it's physically present, you know, it's it's worth more. So that, that picture may help uh, to really drive home the point that the things you're giving away with your game aren't just um, free to you. Uh, you know, they took you time to make and they are valuable. Um, now, this is more contentious, but um, actually, first of all, I'll cover Jackie's thing. This isn't contentious, but you could just make a map of all your backers. So you could drop a pin on the location of each one of your backers. Oh. You could make that an interactive Google map, but I think that I might see. intrude on privacy. But if it's a vague one, uh, then you can just mm. put it in your credits. That's pretty cool I if you've see. got a huge amount of backers and you just want to show like this broad yeah. map. It, it, that was That was a small idea. Um, but it, it could be fun. I think it's more fun than like a, a serious reward, but um, that could mm -hmm. be nice. Uh, yeah. yeah One idea. thing uh, that may or may not apply to your game is you can offer the outtakes or unused assets that were generated around mm -hmm. making the game. And okay, that would only be interesting for other game devs, I suppose. Or well, well if there's unused characters uh, design, for example, they they still look cool, and they're still sort of around the product of the game. So yeah, yeah. I, I think for example, unused character design, you would put in an art book and to just highlight more the process. You yeah. know, like this is where it started, and this is the end, and. I think that big companies would never give these things no. out. <laughs> Just also for <laughs> um, company secrets, I suppose. But maybe if you're indie and yeah, but I, I personally would probably not go that route. Yeah. But maybe that's just like personal preference. It's an option. I mean, if your unused assets or outtakes look absolutely awful, then <laughs> there's probably not much point showing them anyway. But if there's a character who you thought, actually, that that's cool, just doesn't really fit the game well, um, you know, if it has a value as a digital asset, you're not technically ruining your chance of ever using that asset again if you include it in a digital art book. You can still use it in a subsequent game and you haven't signed away any yeah. rights to it. Um, although I'm sure if you're a bigger company, it gets more complex. And obviously, if you have a deal with a publisher or you don't fully own your assets, uh, I think we're in uh, complex legal territories that you just need to clear up to in order to do this. I, I really don't know how that would work. Um, yeah, the most contentious one on the list is you could offer as a reward uh, a discount or just free access to all your future games. As wow, a that's a big, uh, interesting idea. That's interesting. And that's yeah, cool. Frankly, as far as Dark Paradigm Games is concerned, I think we're as vague on that idea is oh, on that idea as a backer would be. But I think if you've sold your team, uh, uh, phrasing, sorry, if you've marketed your team <laughs> extremely effectively, <laughs> the idea of buying into yeah. all your future games might be very appealing to your backers. Yeah, yeah. It's also um, maybe giving safety of, oh, they want to make more games. Okay, um, I'm in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if you're really good at cooking, you could also offer baking cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shipping may take 10 months. But I think that fits in with our brand. It's kind of Dark Paradigm Games. I think your in-game character drinks poison <laughs> several cookies. times. So our poisonous mm. uh, like mold cookies might, might go down pretty well. 
I think we even have moldy candy in the game. So rotten candy, definitely. Hey. There we go. We could give out <laughs> rotten candy. That's actually an in-game <laughs> item in the real world. <laughs> Only licked once. <laughs> <laughs> licked, <laughs> licked once individually by each member of the team. Oh no! <laughs> Which means we'd have to travel. Okay, all across I start. The world. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, somehow uh, that would have to be a very expensive reward. I think <laughs> <laughs> for the food poisoning that we'd all get. I don't mind if I have to beat this the first one. Yeah, you, know? you just eat candy. It's the it's the rest of the team I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Uh, yeah. Um. So the uh, the free copy of all your future releases, I think you can also limit that to saying like um, free copy of the next five games we make or something as well, just in case you think oh. you're going to make thousands of releases in the future and you want to price that at a hundred dollars reward, tier, at which point actually, yeah. well, I don't know. There's it's It's useful to have people who really stand behind your studio. Anyway. Something to consider. Yeah, I, I think a discount or something would be... Okay, let's say you make five additional games and they are all free. Oh, yeah. If they're <laughs> all free to play, feel, then... Um, so weird about it. So then you would again give out f free currency or... I don't yeah. know. But I think it's a good way to get people interested in the next games you're building. I think so, yeah. Um, you could also, instead of offering free future games you'd offer early access to all your future games or uh, just yeah. whatever but that that future game part is actually quite nice to have in your kickstarter even if you don't intend yeah. anybody to pledge that amount um simply because it shows that you have future plans as a studio i think that's exactly. quite nice yeah i agree um do we have any other rewards from my side i think yeah, well, maybe DLC or expansion packs, if that's something you want your game to have. Um, offer the, these for free, additionally. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but otherwise... Yeah, that's everything mm. I, I had for the rewards. Uh, one thing to note is Kickstarter themselves say that the most popular pledge amount is $25. So um, ah. I would say mm -hmm. for that tier, you probably want to offer a copy of the game. Uh, most, I think that a good deal of indie games are in that price point anyway, so you're not doing too badly. Mm -hmm. And just make sure, uh, perhaps focus your reward tiers around that $25 so that that's the kind of main bracket. Yeah. So my most pressing question would be now, where would we go with <clears throat> Legion's Masters? Would we go for Kickstarter or would we go for Indiegogo? You know, I think that maybe the Kickstarter Indiegogo approach. Yeah. Um, cause yeah. Did, did my arguments convince you? I'm, I'm, uh, I think so. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. But then we have a plan now. That's good. Not that we didn't have one before, but did we? Uh, did we mention by the You're way the, same line. the the length of the campaign? Because <laughs> Kickstarter as well, they yes. recommend under thirty days, 30, but around thirty, 30 days. to thirty-five. I, I actually researched thirty to thirty-five. Oh. That's mm. interesting. Why do they recommend less then? Well, hmm. we end up with a similar amount of days anyway. Uh, so we're, I think, we're talking in a kind of twenty-eight to thirty-five day ballpark here. Mm. And interestingly, that's not because it means you get your money sooner or anything. They are actually saying that if, for example, your campaign lasts 60 days, which might be the maximum, I, I'm not sure. If your campaign lasts 60 days, you're less likely to get your funding, even if it's the same amount. I th that, that's what I Kickstarter think a short, I think a short amount of time gives more urgency. And confidence. So maybe it's indeed good to go for shorter times. Oh, and that's that's an important point. So uh, the tone of your campaign should also, uh, and your reward tiers, try to play a bit on the uh, on FOMO, fear of missing out. So a lot of your mm -hmm. reward tiers should be limited tiers. 
there's a practical element to this. Absolutely. Uh, Jackie, for example, I, I think, cannot just yeah. draw 10,000 people's digital portraits and put them in Legion's Masters. Definitely. That would take her two years. I mean, I can years, because I'm awesome. Uh, probably. <laughs> um, Give me 10 days. 10 days. <laughs> and no sleep. <laughs> yeah, and there will be oh, stigma. <laughs> no i'm sure that'd be pretty good actually i'm sure you come up with something decent yeah let's do this um yeah th there's that practical reason but also it's really useful because um it's a psychological phenomenon that if there is a perceived scarcity around an item that means if an item seems to have a finite number then it is perceived as more valuable um so if yeah. you only offer uh um one tier that lets you meet the developers in person then that seems more valuable than if you offer five of them quite simply exactly. uh, but it also means that the person who was thinking oh maybe i'll buy that but i'll think about it it means they're now thinking well what if somebody else buys it before i get a chance and that's fear of missing out yeah um there's this unique thing that they're interested in but if they think well there's so many of them um there's no fear of missing out there's no urgency around buying that product and who knows maybe the next time they come to kickstarter they see a different game campaign that actually they prefer to yours so ideally mm. the moment they visit your campaign you want them to back your campaign yeah we agree on urgency ask for help don't be too shy and um fear of yeah. missing out indeed. and actually um we've talked a lot about what the text should do We haven't talked about just how important your header image is. That might be the most important thing, to be honest, because that's the thumbnail people see when they're searching. Yes, the thumbnail is so important. And directly after the thumbnail, the, the next important thing is the trailer, the video. And after that, just a lot of pictures, a lot, a lot of pictures yeah. and preferably GIFs. And you, you have these headers where um, uh, in Kickstarter, for example, everything is... Um, in sections um, what are the risks and so on and then everything is with a beautiful GIF header and I think that's also how we will make it um, because they just draw more attention and you want as much attention as you can get and what I've also noticed the first few lines are so so important you don't want to mess these up the text is almost I, I personally felt that the text is not as important as the pictures yeah the pictures are really and important everything I've read has agreed with that so just imagine that the person looking at your page doesn't have much time and doesn't have a particularly strong attention span. Um, yeah, or tell your story assume with pictures. they're not reading. They're they're assume they're not reading the text. You have to tell it through pictures. Now, one important thing is um, your header image should include some text. Uh, Kickstarter actually says they like to see quite a clean header image. However, I have not seen any successful game that did not have its name, for example, in that header image and thumbnail. And mm -hmm. also normally the studio that made it. And often where it's available to buy, for example, the App Store or the Google Play Store, that little icon of the, you know, the Apple with a bite out of it is very recognizable. It immediately tells somebody, this is something I can get from my tunes. And that picture mm -hmm. has saved you mm -hmm. 10 words and it's immediately told a lot of information about your product before they've yes. even clicked on it. It's in the header image. What what people are also including in the header image is if it got funded in a certain amount of like 12 hours after release it already got funded, then they include that in the header picture too. Yeah. Because it again gives that security feeling of, oh, okay, then I can also pledge some more and maybe... Uh, invest into something cool that's about to um, come out. Yeah. And um, just a few things I noticed, not necessarily from successful games, but just from other stuff, which I think tells you a lot about the platforms, is uh, the phrase or some variation of the phrase world's first is extremely common. So something saying it's the uh -huh. world's first version of a certain thing. It might be like a pen knife that's been combined with a grill um, <laughs> that's certainly mm -hmm. a world first um, but this idea of carving out your niche in that crowdfunding campaign and just making some space for your product by saying this is truly unique and something to be excited about um, that text 
is often in that header image. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's clickbait effectively, but it, it works. It's um, something that Kickstarter, I think themselves, uh, don't necessarily recommend on their own advice, but pretty much any other page that's giving you advice will say, try to generate an idea of scarcity or uniqueness with even this picture. Um, it should also have a lot of personality, I think. And ideally, it tells them everything they need to know. It's impossible. But in an ideal world, this header image would literally tell them everything there is to know about your game without being cluttered. So it's about like mm, getting that mm. mood perfectly spot on. Okay, um, well, then let's discuss the video because it's indeed super important to have one and what it should do. And we already said you need to sell your personality and you need to sell the personality of the game in your video. What else, Edwin? Tell us <laughs> everything. <laughs> so um, most people recommend keep it to uh, about two to three minutes. There's actually some quite successful uh, campaigns that are less than two minutes. So brevity is definitely the best here. Um, and most people say try to make it an objective to fully explain what your product is within the first 10 seconds of the video. Now, if there's a few gaps in knowledge after those 10 seconds, fine. But um, if you're not explicitly explaining what your game is in those first 10 seconds, then something else I've noticed which is very successful is give just a complete idea of the kind of mood and emotion of your game in those first 10 seconds. So if you're not immediately and clearly explaining that that game, um, just go for a really strong mood. And uh, that lets the, the person viewing it feel what your product is, which I think is just as important. Um, the music can be extremely helpful for establishing a mood almost immediately in the video. Um, hmm. Like if it's got like a tense sound, then yeah, you know, it's going to be dramatic. It, it might be a, a shooter with a serious plot, something like that. If it's got like a xylophone or a glockenspiel or a ukulele or something, okay, lighthearted, fun game. Um, and the, the music gives you that information in one second, if not less, to be honest. So, um, uh, yeah, try to grab their attention. Um, generally, uh, Kickstarter does give you statistics on how many people are watching your video and how many people are watching it all the way to the end. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why, but a couple of websites were saying aim for a third completion rate, which means a third of people watching your video watch it till the end. I'm not quite, yeah. I'm, I don't know why that number, I mean, 100% would be better. Um, but sure, a, a third, apparently. Um, but I think <laughs> what the, the main point it's making there is keep it fairly short and succinct. And if there's anything you think, actually, the, maybe that's not so interesting. Or even if you're asking yourself if this is relevant, um, probably just take it out. It also looks great if you are in the video. Um, so we talked about having your photos everywhere and, and whatnot, but yeah, it looks good to be in your video talking, uh, frankly, about your game. Um, now there's there's plenty of outliers to this um, to this advice. Uh, abductions video, for example, I think was almost eight minutes long, so that that's pretty long. I'm not gonna lie, I scam uh, skimmed through it because I saw it was eight minutes long. And I didn't particularly want to yeah. spend eight minutes watching the video. So I, I don't know if that's even exam a good example of a good video, but the, the campaign was successful. And I think uh, a part of, partly the game's nature comes into play here. It's a slower paced game. It's uh, like there's a slower pace of gameplay. Um, it's a story based game. So people might want to take more time with it feel like they're being told a story, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so when you're making a video, it partly depends on your product, but a classic trailer structure, uh, this is from a music composer's perspective, is in three parts. It has an introduction, one section that rises in mood, it drops back down, a second section that rises in mood, it drops back down. 
sometimes the third section's left out and then there's some sort of outro uh like an ending mm. portion of the video that um yeah. musically speaking often echoes what happened in the introduction and actually generally emotionally it has the same emotion as the introduction so it's just it's like a bookend where the introduction encourages you to focus in on the video um gives you an emotional idea then with these two rising or three rising middle sections you can give more uh, just kind of details so um for legion's masters for example those first 10 seconds would be uh establishing the dark universe with quite moody music um mm -hmm. it would perhaps show a pan of the hunting areas so this is all giving as broad an overview of the game as possible it would show the uh, pet care screen something like that so we've covered the most important aspects of the game in that time and then the first rising section would be talking about how you can collect pets and um, I mean, this aspect of the game is still under construction, but how they have different abilities, how the fighting system works, uh, how some pets are rarer than others, uh, how you need to look after the creatures and so on. So we're getting into mm. more detail mm. for that bit. And then the next section would be perhaps more to do with the hunting ground mechanic of how now that you have these creatures, you can explore different hunting areas and how it's telling you this overall story that's uh, rich in lore and you're discovering um, all of this stuff about the Legion's Masters universe as you progress through the game. Um, that would be if we had two rising sections. Um, and then in the outro, um, again, you just have something, again, that's more of a mood. So uh, maybe like rising green fog around the Legion's Masters uh, banner. Uh, with uh, just some some music and uh, details of when the game's going to launch and where you can download mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, basically we're going from broad overview, which is as quick as possible in the beginning, and very, very carefully establishing a very specific mood as quickly as possible. Then more detail in the, the middle bits. It, it really depends on the game. And then this, this uh, final bit... Um, most trailers tell you when it's launching. I mean, that's pretty common knowledge for like a film or a game uh, and on what platforms. Um, yeah, and I, I think Kickstarter actually says that the videos that um, were self-made, homemade, didn't necessarily do worse. Yeah, that that's also my experience from analyzing most of the campaigns that there's not that much of a difference if any... Because for cardboard games, for example, I, I, or tabletop games, I see very often just the faces of the developers explaining why what they're making is awesome and why you should help yeah, them. Which is a really effective approach. Um, that said, uh, again, even if you're taking that approach, uh, just be careful in the, that first bit of the video that is just so clear what your product is. Because uh, talking yeah. takes longer than showing. Definitely. Um, one minor point is you can include captions and translations for your video uh, to broaden your market. So. You mean undertitle? Yeah. Or what? Um, uh, subtitles, subtitles, mm. subtitles, captions, translation, text, uh, whatever that is. Um, obviously, only include that if your game is actually being marketed to countries that speak those languages. It's pretty uh, dishonest, I guess, or just stupid if your game is in English and you've included Russian translation. Mm, what's very interesting is that uh, Kickstarter also starts to apparently reach out to more Asian countries because we talked earlier about the Hong Kong dollar and... Um, That's uh, apparently a thing that you reach more Asiatic regions. Yeah. And um, if you have a lot of Asian backers, then maybe make sure that you have a game uh, localized in their region because otherwise, well, they can probably not play it. Yeah. As a stretch goal, people offer localization of the game in other countries. Yeah. Often with visual novels, they'll say, uh, yeah, it's uh, the originals in English, or I mean, they're often in Japanese. Once we reach this target, we can uh, afford to get 
a translation and a localization for uh, mm, Spain, mm. whatever. In which case, I would include a Spanish translation in your video or whatever, you know, or the option to turn that on uh, yeah. because yeah. your campaign is still of interest to, uh, uh, you know, that market. Ah, we haven't mentioned the uh, budget breakdown. Oh, yeah, go for it. Definitely. I, I personally think um, I didn't do that much research on it. I mostly went through the pledges and what um, was the highest pledges, what I've seen so far, and that I found also that the 25 or like 10 US dollars to, you know, like 200 uh, seemed good for me. But there were also like these crazy amounts of 5,000 um, yeah, where wow. I feel you really need to explain <laughs> how that comes uh, to happen and i would understand if if you have a lot of um uh tangible goods you're sending out because these are really expensive to make um especially for example the art book i mentioned earlier 25 uh, art books already come at a price of well around 200 500 ish so if if and and you usually cannot print less. You cannot just go and print one art book. There needs to be a certain demand for it. Otherwise, you're just yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> you cannot just print hundred art books and then you you only printed all these art books for one single person. And there's there's a economy <laughs> and you're of still scale. Sitting on, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I was thinking when I was talking about the. Uh, uh, budget breakdown actually is what are you going to do with your reward pledge and that needs to be completely transparent um in yes. quite a few cases and i think the most in just the best way to do this to be honest is make a pie chart um saying where the money's going to go for example if your target pledge is three thousand dollars your pie chart has a third saying a thousand dollars goes to marketing, a third saying a thousand dollars goes to getting voice actors, and a third saying the extra thousand dollars goes to um, making your game work on iOS instead of Android, or uh, something like that. That's completely hypothetical, uh, but please do research mm. this extremely thoroughly because you are accountable for the money you've been pledged, and. The moment that your backers think the their money is not being used for what they intended, uh, you are in trouble, or you could be in trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. You avoid that by being extremely honest with your campaign, extremely realistic, and accounting for uh, just every single dollar that comes your way um, before the campaign, instead of trying to explain where it's going afterwards. <clears throat> yeah. Um, most, um, yeah. Also, one interesting thing is that backers can adjust um, their pledge or change later and um, have like optional buys that they can manage. And uh, for example, if you uh, later on um, unlock stretch goals and people want to invest more and get more, then you can also put that on your side as to how they can do that because not everyone knows about it. Yeah. And then you can again send out emails um, to your Kickstarter backers and tell them about it. Hey, we released more. You can back more and get more out of this. I think I've seen that work the other way as well, uh, where some games get their funding, but a major backer backs out after the campaign. Now, I don't know if that's changed, but oh. I have seen it happen. Um with uh, basically, actually, in, in my case, uh, because I was freelancing, it was a visual novel that um, one of their uh, stretch goals, I think, was to hire a composer to write them a, a nice soundtrack. Oh, so I was on board okay. for that, and then uh, their backer backed out, basically. So they they couldn't. Mm, that's so sad. It, it is sad. It is sad. Um, I don't know the nuts mm, and bolts mm. about that. What I think Marvel United, um, which is also right now on Kickstarter, does well is that they have a roadmap of what happens after Kickstarter ends and um, then they break down the next few weeks and the next few months and so on after after the Kickstarter ended. And I, I think that's a really nice look in the future 
Um, they also had have a chart of estimated shipping costs um, for the US, EU, Canada, Australia, China, and Singapore. And I think that's also really like all with the backer in mind. Okay, what would the person who backs this want to know or what, how can I help them? Um, when I started looking into Kickstarter, I thought, wow, you can you cannot really ask for money from Kickstarter. You cannot really expect that your project gets funded. But I think what you can take away from this all is that there are so many, there's so much more money there on Kickstarter or in crowdfunding right now than there was before because people are more comfortable with it because now they know what it is and what it does and people are in general more accountable uh, for failed uh, projects or what happened when the pledges don't go through or whatever that yeah just just people know more about it and are more likely to invest into your project yeah what what to look out for i mean you you have these pie charts with um no nah, um, the breakdown for the money but really big projects don't really do that even and I think it's not that important to begin with I think what is more important is that you communicate what buying into your project gives the people that buy are buying in and not so much about yeah that it's there But um, because I was mostly looking, for example, at Marvel United, which is currently on Kickstarter. And um, there are so many like additional buy-ins and such, and there's no um, pie chart whatsoever or where the money exactly goes or so on. But there's just so, so, so many pictures of what does what and what pledge gives what. And at that point you're just so convinced <laughs> that it's going to go through that that you feel like oh hmm, I don't really need to know all that much but they have a really really long um, section of uh, risk and refund policy and like the whole section of terms and conditions and so on and um, that I find very small in a lot of projects where I'm really happy to see that um, there's here a longer section about it. Because if I was a backer, I would really want to know, hey, am I going to be refunded if this is not going to work? Yeah. And that they included that is really cool. I think the, the risks and challenges section makes you look uh, very honest, but also it makes you look very uh, realistic and level-headed about what you're doing. I think uh, by including a section with like a similar name, like risks and challenges, um, it actually makes you look far better. Well, um, uh, Kickstarter has that included by default, so you're not getting around it. But a lot of campaigns just have a really, really small, like they are not really putting content into it. Put some it. effort into it. They're not filling yeah. it out. It's just good to have more than two lines there. But also, yeah, actually think it out. Any any uh, campaign on Kickstarter comes with its own risks and challenges, but any game release has plenty of risks and challenges. You're not kidding anybody if you just like write a line or two. Yeah. Like uh, if somebody gets a heart attack, that's that's not <laughs> that's uh, doesn't count <laughs> as properly thinking out what could go wrong with your game and and the challenges ahead. Um, that said, you don't want to just make people think that you can't make the game, but hopefully you've already convinced them of that if they've reached the bottom of the page. In fact, you almost yeah. certainly have convinced them of that if they've reached the bottom of the page. Yeah, I think we still want to go or end your whole presentation with like a good feeling for the person, you know, like that the bottom line of your presentation is still like giving them the feeling of, oh, they can do this. And... um That's where maybe like I would just add another like section where I would at the end um, add additionally something to the risks um, and yeah. with the risks and challenges. Just, just end on a positive note. Yeah. Always with a tone of optimism. So you can say uh, we anticipate needing to spend this amount in our marketing. 
for the game to get enough traction that it then gets shared by people. Uh, so you can say, um, it's a risk if we don't get this amount of money for marketing because then our campaign can't go through fully. But then to say we've thought of that, we can address it with this alternative campaign that we've prepared in case we can't raise enough money or um, in case this marketing campaign costs more than we're expecting. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. just say that you've thought about it and that you've come up with potential solutions and always be optimistic about how you're presenting it. Yeah. Um, something I, I didn't mention that's completely unrelated, but um, it looks really good to put the important words in your campaign in bold. Oh, yeah, definitely. There's, there's a lot of people who do that and do do it, but you choose those words carefully because some people really overdo it, and that just means that you end up reading the whole text. Uh, I think the bold so is for skim reading. So the most successful campaigns I've seen are almost pictures only, yeah. and they have very, very limited text, very limited. And the text they have is inside of the pictures already. Um, so that, that bold text thing is a midway point between the pictures and text. So you can write out your text. It's not an excuse, by the way, to have a really bloated, long, boring text. Um, but with abduction, what I really liked is actually if you just skim read it and just looked at the bold words, it did tell you what the game is. So, for example, that's, mysterious, that's really atmosphere, good, yeah. story rich. This, it might have been a whole paragraph, but those were the words in bold. I actually, I know mm. the type of game now. Those, those words in bold yeah. really told me yeah. if I didn't have time to read the paragraph or I didn't want to, they, they actually told me what I was, roughly what I was getting at. Um, oh, and uh, for all these images and GIFs, and uh, you can also include sounds, by the way. You can link to SoundCloud. You can, I think you can embed it. Oh, yeah, um, definitely, definitely. Uh, it's good to have some of them that are quite a small size, which makes it easier to share them. Yeah. What I've seen also for mobile games is that people include a demo of their game at, at the oh, very Oh, yeah, that's, that's awesome if you can do that. That's the um, best. But but I've also seen that for other games, just like a demo version that people can already like play it a little and figure out if, out if they really want to back yeah. it. Oh, there's. Uh, I'm just looking at my document. There's one thing I haven't mentioned. Um, <laughs> there's uh, again. This is linked to FOMO, fear of missing out, and it's a reward tier. You can offer an early bird reward that uh, gives away the game, or some reward tier at a discounted rate. Uh, for example. Mm. Uh, let's say you pledge $20, you get the game. Well, your early bird tier would be pledge $15 and get the game, but it's got a limited quantity, so there's only 10 of them. And that's really useful just in that very early stage of, of your campaign where you want some social proof and uh, you want to just make it look like a very credible campaign in that initial stage, even if you don't intend to sell every copy of your game for $15. So you just limit that to, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, 100 rewards or something. But that is, that's everything yeah. uh, I can possibly think of now. Anything <laughs> left on your end? No, I think we went really like through everything. Well, uh, in that case, uh, thank you everybody very much for listening. And if you enjoyed the podcast please join our Discord server. There'll be a link in the description and we'll keep you posted for our next podcast. Uh, join us again about this time next month in March 2020. I am Edwin Dyser and I was with... Jacqueline Martin. Thank you so much. <laughs>